Welcome to the third Learn Along of 2020, hosted by Watershed Action Alliance of Southeastern Massachusetts. I am Dori Stoley, Coordinator and Outreach Manager. Today we will hear from our partner in conservation, Wildlands Trust, and three talented young people from the city of Brockton who participated in Envirothon, Massachusetts' leading natural resource education program for high school students that prepares young people for environmental careers and active citizenship. Their comments on learning about nature in an urban environment, their personal stories, and their successful quests for higher education in science, the environment, and health are revealing and informative as we, and you, prepare for our 2021 conference on environmental justice. We start first with Rachel Calderera, Outreach and Education Manager at Wildlands Trust, one of the largest and oldest regional land trusts in Massachusetts. Over the past eight years, we have worked to um, improve that preserve with some grants from the state and some other monies. So we have added new trails, we've added boardwalks, we've created new interpretive signage and all kinds of things. We posted community events out there and we use this as a model of kind of what we can do with a, a new acquisition. And when we were starting our education programs at Brockton Audubon Preserve back in 2014, when I started with Wildlands Trust, we hosted a bio blitz and we did that in partnership with Stonehill College and Brockton High School. And that is when we met um, some of these wonderful kids from Brockton High School and Joyce Boris, who is the teacher and co-coach of Envirothon. She's instrumental in all of this happening over the past uh, six years at, at Brockton High. So we kind of hooked up with Joyce Boris and we kind of took over the science club for the first year of Envirothon at Brockton High School. Um, and that's how it started. So it was an after school program. We would meet weekly with the kids. And on the call today is uh, Mary Kate and Lily, who are both from this first year, this 2015 team that started at Brockton High School. And just a little bit of background on Envirothon. It's a statewide competition in forestry, wildlife, soils, and water. And then there's also a current issue presentation that the teams give, and the issue changes every year. Um, so this first year, I believe the issue is climate change. Excuse me. Um, and it's schools from across the state. It's high school competition. So the location changes every year and 30 or more teams go and compete in these categories each year. So I just wanted to show you a few things that have happened over the years with Envirothon at Brockton High School. Uh, in 2017, this is Nicole's year. She's in some of these pictures. Um, the team came in third in their current issue, which was agricultural soil and water conservation that year. Um, and Joyce, who is right here, hopefully you can see my mouse. She's there at the state house. Um, she received the Secretary's Award for Excellence in Environmental Education, and the whole team got to go to the State House to receive that award. In 2018, the team actually won first place in the current issue, and that year it was partnering with Nature and Watersheds. Uh, that was also Nicole's year, uh, and second place in forestry, which Nicole was also a huge part of. Um, and that on the left is a picture of the team out at their flag pond, and that is the pond that's on their campus that they focus their uh, research around. In 2019, the team placed fifth in the water category. This is kind of, everybody graduated in, 20, in 2018 and we started fresh with a whole new team in 2019. And Joyce Forrest received the Secretary's Award for a second time. We went to the State House with some of the team members and we got to meet with the Speaker of the House, Robert DeLeo, it was really cool. And then this year was a little different. So we were on a great track. We had all these field trips that we had done. We had gone to um, Brockton Audubon Preserve, Stone Farm Conservation Area. We had started work on Flag Pond. We went to the desal plant. We went to the wastewater treatment plant and then COVID happened. So um, <laughs> the competition was canceled, but Envirothon did offer a video challenge and Brockton High was one of five teams who participated in that video challenge. So. Um, Dory, I'd be happy to share a link with you, but the uh, video that they created is on the Mass Envirothon YouTube channel. So the other flagship youth program that we run at Wildlands Trust is called Green Team. So that's our service learning summer program uh, for teens, which also started in 2015. Um, teens from across our region, so Wildlands Trust serves southeastern Massachusetts, and all towns are welcome, teens from all towns are welcome to apply. But the way that we make it more accessible for um, the kids from Brockton is we provide transportation down to our Plymouth headquarters. It's almost an hour drive to our South Plymouth headquarters. So 
um, we're able to kind of get more people into the program that way instead of just kids from Plymouth. So over the years, we, we do trail work, we do carpentry. Here's Nicole down here and Brittany uh, and Tess, they built this bench. Um, some of the kids work on farms. We uh, do all kinds of just outdoor service volunteering. Here's Lily here from the first year. And so just a little bit more about the other kinds of stuff that Wildlands Trust is doing in Brockton through our community stewardship program. Um, we have done a complete restoration of the city's stone farm conservation area, which is the only other piece of land that is in the um, city's department of conservation. That's Connor there on the top left. He's the community stewardship manager. So building boardwalks, installing signage, putting maps in, working with the community on getting the word out and really creating a community preserve here. And it does connect to our Brockton Audubon Preserve. So between the two areas, there's five miles of trails on the west side of the city. Another program is the Greening the Gateway Cities program. That's a free tree planting program. That is a state program. So we do all the outreach for that. So Connor goes around knocking door to door, telling people about these free trees that they can get in their yards. Um, we have increased our partnerships with the schools in the Brockton area, and that's Massasoit Community College and Stonehill College. Um, we have started a flag pond study at Brockton High School, which was inspired by the 2017 Envirothon team's study at that pond. So we have grant work for that to do a science department wide study at the school with the students in the science department. That was supposed to be year one data this spring, but we will resume that when you know school is back in session. Connor also helps the city develop their open space plans um, and he planned the first ever Brockton Nature Festival, which happened last October, which I have some pictures of here. And that was a huge community event for nonprofits and all kinds of community groups across the region to come. We had hundreds of people come out and hike the trails at Stone Farm and meet all the community groups and eat food and play games. It was a really fun time um, and we hope to do it again. We've also recently done a lot of work with our AmeriCorps members at Wildlands Trust. So one of our AmeriCorps members initiated a partnership with the Hancock Elementary School, which borders uh, the Brockton Audubon Preserve. It's literally their backyard. So we were finally able to get some of those teachers on board to bring their students out to that preserve and uh, during the school day and start using it as an outdoor classroom. We also started a multi-year Harvard Forest study at both Brockton Audubon and Stone Farm Conservation Areas and we do that with our Envirothon team. We're hoping to collect year two data this fall. Um, I told you about Brockton Nature Festival already. Some of the staff and board members from Wildlands Trust also recently participated um, in the Island Foundation's equity and inclusion training. And um, that is a little bit on pause right now, but we have created a, a new statement that's going to be on our website about our commitment to equity and inclusion at Wildlands Trust. Another one of our AmeriCorps members made a tree ID trail at the Stone Farm Conservation Area and the signs are installed. So if you're interested in traveling up there and checking it out, I encourage you to. Um, and this year we completed the work at Stone Farm and we are up to 2,200 trees planted in the city of Brockton to increase the canopy cover there. For the future, carrying on, um, even with COVID, we're still committed to our work in Brockton. So we're planning to have a green team um, specifically in Brockton so that we can include more Brockton students next summer. The flag pond study will resume as soon as school is back in session. Um, we continue to promote the natural areas and try to get people out to the two preserves that we have on the west side of the city and, and increase access for that. Um, Envirothon will resume when school resumes again. Our forest study with the Harvard Forest will resume and we're also working on new programs um, to continue our commitment with the Community Stewardship Program in Brockton. So that brings me to today's speakers. These are all Envi Envirothon alumni who are either in college or have graduated college now. So we have Mary Kate Clark who is from the 2015 Envirothon team, Lily Green who was both 2015 and 2016 Envirothon teams and also Green Team Summer 2015 and Nicole Magia, who is 2017 and 2018 in Virathon teams and also on the green team in the summer of 2018. So I'm glad I got through that pretty quickly. Uh, thank you all and I'll give it back over to Dory. Well, thanks so much, Rachel. It's really exciting what you're doing and that can serve as an example to us and uh, members of course, many of our members are also doing very exciting programs, but um, those of you who represent organizations that um, are looking for 
um, ideas, please feel free to contact Rachel about what they're doing. And uh, without further ado, though, I'd like to move along to our, our speakers. And um, uh, they're, they're going to introduce themselves, talk about um, uh, growing up in Brockton, becoming involved with nature and the environment, uh, as well as their work with the Envirothon, and uh, if they're on the green team. Um, also, if they feel uh, they, like they'd like to talk about, they'll talk about issues of diversity and inclusion experiences they've had, both positive and negative in terms of discrimination and stereotyping. After that, we'll have time for questions and answers. And um, I encourage you to ask any questions you may have, but I've also encouraged our panelists to pass on any questions they feel uncomfortable with or just answer them in any way that seems most appropriate for them. I wanna make sure that everybody feels comfortable here. Uh, so without further ado, let's move on to um, Lily. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lily Green. I just recently graduated UMass Lowell with a master with a bachelor's in chemistry and a minor in climate change and sustainability. And I will also be attending a graduate program at UMass Boston for a PhD in the green chemistry program once that resumes in the fall. It will be all virtual. Um, as Rachel introduced, I was part of the very first Envirothon team at Boston High, which was very exciting. At the time, I was part of the science club. I had Ms. Voorhees as a teacher for biology, and we had a sustainability section, and that's how we got introduced to um, Rowan's Trust in a marathon, and it was very, very exciting. Before that, I didn't really have many direct experiences with the environment. There might have been a few things when I was like a Girl Scout when I was little, but all of my experience happened once I met Rowan's Trust, and it opened up a whole new area that I became interested in, hence why I have a minor in climate change and sustainability. Um, should I just go through like the questions, Rachel, that you had listed, or? Yeah, that would be great if you would address those questions. That'd be just super. Thank you. Sorry, I've okay. got myself on mute, so I've got to unmute. No problem. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, Rachel mentioned the pond cleanups and the bio bits and the green team, and those are all great things, especially when I was looking into colleges and what I wanted to do. Um, so what attracted me to Envirothon was, as I mentioned, I was in uh, IB biology, and we had that sustainability section, and it really interested me learning about climate change and the environment and how our actions impact that. Uh, that year we also did um, science fair and my group, we did, worked on recycling in Boxton High. Boxton High is a very big school, has 4,000 plus students and faculty. So we were looking at how we can implement a recycling program with all, within all four colored uh, cafeterias in the buildings. Um, so I think I was just really lucky to be able to be introduced to this content without having to go search for it. A lot of my friends in college, they didn't really get those kind of opportunities. You'd have to, you know, choose the classes or you'd have to really go. And it wasn't until maybe college where you had such options. Um, and Envirothon did really impact my college career. I actually almost changed my major to environmental science. I was a little more focused on the social impact of it. I did want to learn about the science of it because it is important, but that's why I ended up with the minor because I was able to take classes such as law classes that focused on the legal side and the community side of climate change. And before um, I got accepted into the PhD program, I was actually looking into applying with Telecore because I wanted a chance to work outside of a classroom to actually interact with a community and do kind of hands-on projects that remind me of my time during Green Team during that summer. Great, thank you so much for your uh, introduction there. Um, yeah, very exciting to hear about all the different projects and all the um, schooling, school work that you're doing. And, um, and I was amazed that Brockton High School's 4,000 students. That's a lot. So uh, that's, it's, yeah, it seems like uh, having a, a special project that you can work on, a special team to, to be involved with uh, would be important to future generations of Brockton students too. Uh, so let's move on to Mary Kate. 
Hi, everybody. Um, so I was on the 2015 team with Lily. Um, I worked specifically for Envirathon on the water section, and that was mainly inspired by my working with um, Flag Pond kind of like during the school day. So we had like a water section of our biology class with Miss Voorhees, and um, she said, who wants to get in the water? And I just kind of volunteered, put the high waters on, and got right in, and it kind of just her telling us how the water comes from the um, Taunton Rivershed, goes into the pond, and then goes back out, um, and how it's kind of not being sustained in the correct way, and like our lifestyle is impacting it kind of inspired me to join Envirathon and kind of work with it. Um, I actually, before I'll just backtrack, um, I just graduated from UMass Boston with a um, bachelor's of science in biology, but on the pre-med track, um, and then a minor in psychology, and I'm going on to do my master's in child and adolescent psychology um, to work in schools as more of a um, school psychologist. Um, I know that's not environmentally related. However, um, I did work in college. I was on the um, part of the Beacon Voyages for Service at UMass Boston, and it's basically an alternative spring break program where you focus on different social justice issues. And then um, you go to different parts of the country, do service, um, and kind of try to help impact um, the communities there. And this year I was going to lead a team, um, with Rachel at Wildlands and we were going to do a bunch of stuff, but then COVID. Um, but hopefully I, now that we hear that the programs are starting up again, maybe I can get my team to you guys safely. Um, but yeah, growing up in Brockton, I, my mom and dad always encouraged like taking care of the place that you live in because it's helping you grow up. And we always like tried our best to do like the most recycling and make sure like if we see litter, let's put on some gloves, pick them up. Um, but it was kind of, and I would always say like, oh, I'm from Brockton. And like, I would talk about different um, things that we're doing. Like I talked, I would brag in college about Lily's um, recycling project. And I would brag about our work with, um, for the science fair, we did work with Flag Pond. And I would brag about that and they're like oh well why are you focusing on that when you have other like big fish to fry like violence and gangs and all that stuff so they kind of just like took the environment and put it on the back burner just because we have other issues basically to deal with and it kind of always like stuck with me that we're like in this kind of cycle where we don't really focus on the environment and that always kind of stuck with me and I kind of want to in the future using like if I'm working in Brockton schools, like kind of try to change that stigma a little bit. Um, and all of this is kind of really just inspired by Miss V, Rachel, and all my teammates from Envirathon. Um, yeah, that was a lot of rambling. <laughs> I think I'm done. <laughs> now that was not, not rambling at all. That was very interesting. And some of the things I pulled out of that, um, was the importance of modeling good behavior. Your parents modeled good behavior to you, and then Mrs. V and Rachel, and now you're passing that along. Uh, it, and I think that's extremely exciting. So um, thank you. I'm sure other people will have more questions uh, after we finish up. And um, I'd love to hear from Nicole now, if Nicole's ready. Hi, sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, amazing. Uh, so hi, I'm Nicole. Um, First, I want to thank everyone for listening to us and essentially like hearing uh, what we have to say. Um, and so I am, um, although I grew up in Brockton, I actually um, was born in Honduras. Um, and so um, this is like, it was a big, it was a big change. Um, Oh wait, sorry, can you still hear me? It looks like it's asking me to join yep. again. Oh, uh, okay. I can, we can hear you. Oops. Okay. We can hear sorry. you. Okay, awesome. Great, right. right. thank you. Right. Um, so currently I'm a junior, uh, incoming junior 
at Harvard College. Um, I'm majoring in organismic and evolutionary biology with a minor in environmental science and public policy. Um, and so this actually all started because of my experiences in high school with Varazon, Green Team, Ms. V. Um, so sorry, as I was saying, uh, moving from a place like Honduras to Brockton was a big change and a drastic change in many ways, um, a completely new culture, a new language, and most importantly, definitely the environment. I lived in a very small town where if I went outside, like my grandfather had a farm. Um, my We were always used to trees everywhere around us and um, it was not a very dense place at all. And so coming to Brockton, you know, that was a very big change. Um, I think that when I was little, um, my parents did not really have time to, I guess, sort of take us outside to walk. Um, this is what I used to think, um, because they were always working. However, it was not until later that I guess I found out that we did not really know about places where we could just get out of the city and not see buildings everywhere. Um, and so I think that we did not, you know, we did not really hear about it. Um, I did not really hear about it in school. And I guess my parents didn't really either, uh, especially because uh, their main language is Spanish. So, you know, there might have been resources, but at that time, probably not in Spanish. Um, and so it was, again, not until I got into high school where I guess I realized that love for the outdoors and the environment, um, but it had always been there because of the fact that I came from this very green country and this being surrounded by animals and nature, it was just always there. Um, so again, I heard about Envirathon through Miss V. She was amazing, <laughs> definitely one of the most imp impactful teachers I've ever had. Um, and we learned, we did this section in biology um, on sustainability, ecology, evolution, which is why I decided to go on and study evolution. Um, so when I joined Envirathon, um, I decided to do forestry and wildlife because it was again, just sort of there. I kind of loved animals from the start. And the idea of having this opportunity to identify footprints and just go around and, you know, point out that tree and say, I know what type of tree that is. Like, that is pretty amazing. Um, and it's something that I never would have had the chance otherwise to do so. Um, and then I joined a green team when Rachel told us about all these different opportunities that we would have where we went, um, including we went to an organic farm. We got to go kayaking and track turtles down using a GPS system. We built benches. Um, we even went camping, which is something I had never done before. Um, and again, all these experiences were through these different programs and outreaches. Um, and I think that um, I realized until later, especially when I went to college, that these were experiences that a lot of people have already had. And the difference that I noticed, especially when I went to college, was that the majority of these people did come for, from more places with more resources. And um, it was there that I noticed like the lack and absence of people of color in the uh, env environment and the outdoors. Um, in college, uh, my first year, I did this outdoors program where first years get to go basically on a six day backpacking trip into New Hampshire, just for six days, like just go hiking. Um, definitely again, <laughs> an amazing experience. Um, and that was my first time doing that, but everyone else on the trip, they had, you know, they had gear, they had hiking boots, they had backpacks and all that stuff that was theirs. Meanwhile, I had to rent my stuff. Um, so again, this is when I noticed that it was like a big change, you know, people like this, have experienced all the time with the outdoors. Um, and for us, like it is different, it is harder. Um, and so back to, sorry, I'm going on a little bit, but um, back to high school again, my senior year of high school, 
Um, I continued with Virathon again just because I loved I loved it. Um, and along with um, Ms. B's class in biology, I wanted to take um, AP Environmental Science, which was a class taught by Mrs. Watt. Um, however, when during that summer, they actually did not know if that class was going to take place because of funding. Um, and everyone that was planning to take that class was actually very upset. Uh, you know, we were very excited about this class. And thankfully, Ms. Watt fought for the class and it did up, we did end up taking it. Um, and I will say it was, it was the class and basically all these students that shaped who I am today. Um, in that class, we talked about climate change. We talked about more, more importantly, like how would we be able to help and what are practices that we should take into account now. Um, it's the reason now I'm a vegetarian and tell my parents eat less meat, you know, like watch out for our carbon footprint. It's the reason that I don't use plastic straws anymore or just like have changed to bamboo toothbrushes, things like that, and things that I pass on to my family. And it definitely was very impactful and was the reason I went into environmental science in college as well. Um, so I think that that's the reoccurring theme um, throughout, I guess, growing up in Boston, where we were not really, again, like Mary Kate said, I guess priority is not put on educating people and I guess like making sure that people understand what is going on, which is very unfortunate because as studies have shown, climate change, um, plastic pollution do affect minority majority populations more so than like for example towns around us that do have more resources. Um, when we did the the Envirathon my last year on the watershed, we were not aware of the the problems that we had with our water resources and it was in our own community and these were things that we could do and change but again we we're just not made aware of them and i think again that's just a big problem and i hope um that in the education system they are trying to change this um that starting off in elementary school middle school they start to implement programs on education on the environment and specifically in our community, um, because kids do just, just do not know, um, as well as just sources and resources in different languages, because like we are a big immigrant city, um, and you know, not everyone speaks English, and not everyone is really aware of the environment in that way as well, especially because it's not part of Boston naturally. Um, yeah, that's what I have to say. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Nicole. Um, wow, lots of food for thought. Um, and those of you who are doing work and providing opportunities to different communities should really give yourselves a pat on the head. I'm thinking of um, uh, Herring Ponds providing camperships, uh, North and South Rivers providing uh, education to all students in, uh, I think, fifth grade and so forth. So. This is really a testament from, from all three of these young women of how important these opportunities, providing these opportunities, both in the outdoors, but also have a receiving education about biology, climate change, the environment, and so forth. So I thank all three of you very much for these uh, uh, presentations. And I'd like to move on with time for questions from our WA members. And remember to unmute yourself uh, to ask a question. But uh, uh, if you want to just uh, raise your hand, and I guess I'll call on you. So we just have one at a time. Okay, Don. Sorry, I I was most disturbed by the comment that was made that there were more pressing problems, and the perception that people have that there are more pressing problems. There are problems of equal equal value, but you know. It, it sort of devalues you, the students' values by saying that, because honestly, you have to follow your own heart and do what you're best at. My question is a tough one, and you can choose not to answer it. I, 
I have a PhD in organic chemistry, but I'm just learning the uh, science of the, uh, the, the watershed. And I'm concerned that at some point we're going to reach a, an echo tipping point. And by that, I mean, there will be a time when we've gone so far down the, uh, the path to destruction that we're either not going to be able to correct it or we're going to have to spend an outrageous amount of money to do so. And I'm wondering from your studies collectively, all three of you, uh, of environmental science, I'm wondering what your opinion is as to how close we are to said tipping point. Wow, that's that's quite a big question there. Uh, would uh, someone like to address that? Lily, Nicole, or Mary Kate? Yeah, I I would like to address that. Um, I think we are close. There is absolutely no denying that, and the evidence is very clear. Um, even though us, you know, we're pretty lucky to not have to see those firsthand, um, but other countries will are seeing it. Um, I mean, how clear can more studies show than? In a couple of years, part of Boston might be underwater because of iceberg melting points, um, the droughts. It's evidently clear. And, you know, as, as depressing as it, it is, I think part of the way to the solution is accepting the fact that we are extremely close to that tipping point. And is, it is not until that point where we realize how close we are when people will actually start to do stuff for it. Yeah. Thank you very a, much. That was, that was a, a, a great response to a, a highly charged question. I, I totally agree with you that unfortunately the way politics works, it's, it works so that you really have to be so close just to, to, to start it's very costly thanks thanks very much i'm impressed james i know that you have a question would you like to unmute and ask your question yeah can everybody hear me yes um so this is to anyone but um i'm a member or i'm the ecology program director and watershed ecologist at the jones river watershed association um, we often have volunteer programs and education efforts um, and we typically just advertise in the town that we operate in, which is Kingston, Massachusetts. But I would be very interested in hearing your suggestions uh, about advertising to a broader audience to be as inclusive as possible. Any um, perspectives you might have, uh, I think would be super valuable for us. Who would like to comment on that one? And remember, we understand that this is your personal perspective. We're not expecting you to speak um, as an expert on this, but personal perspectives can be very uh, helpful, especially when we gain them from a lot of different people. Lily, I see you've unmuted. Yes, I have. Um, so I'm not really very familiar with the Kingston area, but I remember when we learned about the whole tournament that shed and we learned all of the surrounding um, communities that were also affected, I think it'd be more important to broaden it, even if it's not to a community that's directly affected by that specific watershed. I'm sure there's another watershed that they can use to become interested in and to kind of learn a bit uh, to, sorry, but basically, um, <laughs> even if they're learning about a different watershed, hopefully it will spark the interest in, you know, learning and looking up what their watershed is and how the state of it is and how they can get more involved with their own watershed. I think probably um, going directly to the towns right next to Kingston and doing some kind of maybe after school program or presentation, especially to high schoolers. And in a way also maybe, in a, I always thought it'd be interesting to see kind of like an environmental kind of job fair, because I don't really know until I entered college what kind of um, jobs I could get that were relating to the environment. Now I do. So I think that's a great way to help people choose what kind of colleges they want to do, what kind of majors they want, 
to prepare for those type of jobs. Kind of rambled off <laughs> there. No, that was very helpful. We got some definite um, suggestions there, uh, very specific suggestions, such as doing outreach to high school students. And from speaking with all of you, that seems like that's a very good age to target. Also providing after school activities um, and an environmental job fair, all very good um, suggestions. Thank you. Anyone else have suggestions to add to those? Could I add something on? Great, yes, please. Um, I think one big thing definitely is social media, um, especially right now. Um, for example, um, reaching out to students that might already be involved and then spreading, asking them to you know, spread information through their social media accounts. Um, I think that is one big, big way um, to spread information um, because I know a lot of the times, especially now, um, for example, through movements in Brockton, um, what people have done is, you know, they've made a flyer and it has just went viral through social media. So that is definitely one big thing that I would suggest as well. Yeah, that's great. We need to ensure that even our organizations that are made up um, of older generations remember the social media. Thank you for that. Yeah. And Mary Kate, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I was actually going to like speak on social media, but then also trying to figure out a way, um, cause I feel like also, um, like as much as we think like, oh, little kids don't get it, they do get it. And, um, just kind of having maybe like an environment day or whatever. Cause I remember, um, just like talking with my mom about flag pond when I first started like researching into it and she was like yeah there were boat races on the pond and it was so much like the water line was so much higher and all this stuff and when we start started doing research with it it's significantly like getting shallower I don't know I haven't looked over there yet because that's a COVID testing site right now so I haven't really looked over there but um it was significantly um getting more shallow um as we were doing our research and just I would kind of hate to see it be not a pond anymore. Um, so, and I think that also starts with getting the younger generations into it too. Um, maybe like, cause the closest elementary school to Flag Pond is the Kennedy. Um, and that's where I went and that's where Lily went. And, um, and there was also a, like a small kind of like pond there, but it's now dried out. Um, so just kind of maybe getting their voices into it, maybe not like the first graders, but like maybe third through fifth grade, um, maybe then trying to get them involved and see if they can do any like small little projects to show that we can sustain at a younger age. Yeah, thank you, great suggestion. So not only high school students, but students of a younger age, get them on the right track. Um, and we know that that can have a big effect. Um, we, uh, Mary Kate also suggested keeping it local. And there's so many schools that do have opportunities right outside their door that they are, don't use for whatever reason, liability, uh, reluctance for the teachers to take them out, the administration doesn't give enough time to actually get them out. And those are things that can be done, each of you law members in your local communities. Great suggestions, all three of you, thank you very much. Um, do we have other questions? Yes, Samantha. Uh, unmute. Yeah. Hi. This is so interesting, and it's just really heartening to hear the to hear your perspective as young people. Um, and I guess the question I had was specifically about the water issues that um, you know kind of bind us together with our watersheds and Brockton's use of water and its impacts on our watersheds. And you said that. It wasn't until I think you were maybe doing the Envirothon that you had sort of gained knowledge of that. And I'm curious if there would have been any opportunity where we could build a curriculum that could provide the education at a different point for everybody in the school system there. Um, you know, where do you think it would have fit in? Is there a, a time? Is, you said there's 4,000 students, so that's a lot. I don't know if that means there's 1,000 in each grade. <laughs> um, you know, we're not going to probably be able to take everybody out um, to do outdoor programs, but 
there should be some way we could provide, maybe with the Jones River um, and the Monpons at Pond, we could have a sort of united curricula that would provide the students some kind of understanding of how, where their water comes from. Um, we do that here in our own watershed, um, but it seems like we should be transferring it to Brockton. We do it in the fifth grade uh, for everybody. Um, maybe that's something we should investigate as a group. And I'm speaking to our, my colleagues out there <laughs> to say, you know, we already have some stuff that we could pretty much customize um, if we could find the right people to talk to. That's often been our challenge, like needing to find the right teachers who are willing to modify their curriculum to uh, embrace some place-based learning. And I don't know, maybe Rachel might have some thoughts about that too, how we could transfer that. But any, any, I'm not sure it was really, it was, the question is, where would we fit in? How, like, should we do it in high school? Should we do it in fifth grade? Should we do it in middle school? Um, where do you think would be most receptive to learning about that? Uh, that's super exciting, um, Nicole, Mary Kate, and Lily. That you're speaking here is is really making this group think about uh, doing some more education in Brockton. I mean, that's just absolutely thrilling. So, can anyone answer um, Samantha's question about what age you think might be appropriate or grade? Any perspectives on that? How to find a teacher? Maybe that's more important than the actual grade is finding a teacher, administration, or school that's more open to it. I'm just trying to think back because I, I know that a lot of the science teachers, they'll um, kind of not teach to the um, MCAS, but for at least for science in 10th grade, that's we take the biology MCAS, so their kind of curriculum is basically like teaching us the material so that we do well on it. Um, and same thing in middle school and eighth grade. Um, and so it might just be kind of forming around that, maybe like after the MCAS is taken, um, and, or maybe like if there's a specific, like if you do like a week of like environmental awareness, sustainability, where they just take one week out of the curriculum instead of changing their whole thing around. Um, I'm not sure, I'm not a, I'm not a teacher yet. <laughs> but um, maybe just kind of doing that. I would think that if you implement it at each stage of education, it would spark kind of this ongoing trend where you keep that in the back of your mind. Um, so like I said earlier, like starting younger and like just maintaining it kind of doing like different levels, so maybe like in the elementary school, it's more of like a basic understanding and then middle school kind of tying in a little bit more um, background. And then in high school, kind of seeing the more sustainability side and then like you could do this in the future and this is how you can do that. Yeah, yeah, good points. Yeah, I, I, I think that there's, um, I mean, we, we do that actually in our watersheds and I think I don't know why it didn't dawn on me until you just were here talking to us, but clearly it would be smart of us to partner with um, the Jones and the Monponset folks and figure out if we can take what we've already kind of established and bring it over to, um, you know, in your school system and see if, <laughs> see if we can get that going. Um, so Rachel and James, I'm looking at you. I know you can't see me looking at you, but... Um, <laughs> that I think would be really smart on our part to think about how we could do that. So I'm happy to um, share what we've got and see how we can partner to do that. We've had some experience with that. And the real question, at least for Plymouth, has been to find the right person to introduce it. And that's been really, really tough. And especially, I, I love the idea of, of starting young and, and going, uh, progressively up. Uh, my wife is uh, in charge of the program that the Garden Club gives to Plymouth, but to my knowledge, that's the only program that they do with outside groups. It, it's, it's just not a partnering atmosphere for whatever reason. So the approach would have to be 
to the right person in the, the, the school system to get that started. But God, what a great idea that is. And I, I don't think that there's a whole lot of things that are more important than the environment. And you're absolutely right that the kids make a huge difference. The Garden Club gives a seedling tree to kids and they remember that up through their, their high school years that they got a seedling tree, they went with their parents to plant it. Why are we planting this tree? Well, trees make oxygen, you know, give the simple answer. So the barrier is us, basically. <laughs> Henriette. Thank you, Don. Yes, I, this is uh, just to follow up on what Don said about Plymouth. Um, it, and it's one of the things that has struck me from everything that the speakers have, have shared with us is the, is the continuing lack of linkage between environmental justice and social justice. And that is a very core problem. But I was going to say about Plymouth, we had, and, and this is also a comment about social media, the importance of, of youth communication via social, social media. We had a, a vigil in Plymouth in early June, which was very, very inspiring. It was very inspiring because it was in the wake of the George Floyd killing. And it was so inspiring because it was dominated by the youth sensibility um, because No Place for Hate and uh, Indivisible Plymouth had the marvelous sense to forefront what young people, how they were experiencing this and why they understood the, the wrongness of it, of, of, the, of the police brutality and the, and the persistent social injustice. Um, so the youth were the ones who spread the news of this vigil like wildfire in social media. And we elders in the League of Women Voters and No Place for Hate and so forth, we, we were hardly even aware of how they got the word out because we were all just amazed when all, well over a thousand, probably 1400 people showed up. And, and it wasn't thanks to what we did on Facebook, because that's ancient, ancient social media from the point of your generation. And it may have been on Instagram, but we didn't see that much response to the Instagram. But I know that there were other things going on, like word of mouth and TikTok and whatever is current. Uh, so I love the fact that once youth are involved, there's a whole new kind of communication system that we in my generation are, it's, we don't know it, we, we're not aware of it. But also what has struck me is that as a result of this vigil, and this goes to Don's comment about the schools, what, how you get teachers involved, uh, the school system, and the Y have both become involved in a poster contest that is happening during the summer uh, on, on the issues of social diversity and equity. And there were teachers in the school system who were so excited to embrace this and partner with the League, with Indivisible, with No Place for Hate, with Black Lives Matter. So they're there. And all we need to do is make the linkage between the social equity and the environmental equity. And that makes me think about one fact that is staring us all in the face, and that is COVID. COVID is nature's message to us that we have caused a a catastrophic imbalance in the environment. We would not be in an age of pandemics if we hadn't if we hadn't disrespected the the the, the rainforests and all of the other parts of the environment. So COVID is here and it has disrupted everything that we do and the way we do it. And it has a lot of it's it's been terrible, but it's also had some 
silver linings and it is a re it should be a revelation and one of the revelations that should be very just hitting us right in the face is that it has impacted uh, minority communities communities of color far more devastatingly than it has the white communities so COVID itself is giving us all these messages about the importance of nature and how the imbalance has directly uh, impacted it, it is it is it is increased the dis, the inequities and it's made them very visible oh made, henrietta thank you so much for your comments and for pointing that out that is so important to note and um that's why i was uh interested in hearing that um one of your envirothon uh uh, colleagues has gone on into public health and I know Mary Kate you're interested in, in child psychology all of that is very related and um, we continue to when we work for environmental justice we are also working we need to work for social justice as well and as you said the pandemic has really pointed some of uh, those inequities out to us uh, very obviously they uh, joined at the hip and I, I just wanted to add that because I believe that there are teachers in in the Plymouth system who are now involved in this poster contact, I think we just need to go back to those teachers and say, let, this is so great. Now let's, let's link in the environment here. Yeah, yes, so that's a great suggestion is who's already involved, who has shown that they're interested and wants to be engaged and let's continue with them. So let's uh, everyone take note of that. That's a very good point. Um, uh, any more questions for our panelists? I don't want to take up more of their time than we uh, than we need to, and uh, we'll finish up the rest of our meeting. I'd love to hear Melissa's question. So um, first, I just wanted to say thank you to you young ladies. I think it's amazing that you you come on today and and share your stories with us um, about you know your very powerful um, situation and your experience. So thank you. But I think um, my question sort of goes along with, um, I recently in the spring of 2020, I co-taught a university classroom. And the classroom, uh, the class was called Indigenous Women's Leadership and Tribal Nation Self-Determination in North America. And in the beginning of the semester, we polled our students and we had a large class of almost 30. And we, we asked them just a very simple question to find out and just see how many students actually knew anything about indigenous communities, either in Massachusetts, North America, or you know, what they had heard. And we were, I, I was really, really shocked to be in a university setting and have, I'd say 95, probably higher percent of our students that said they had absolutely no knowledge of indigenous issues, indigenous people, and they had no clue at all about the people in, in Massachusetts or in their own communities. So I think my question, we, we hear a lot uh, right now, especially about inclusion and uh, equity. And I, I, you know, I feel as native people, you know, we know well that there is little knowledge of you know the actual history and the contemporary existence of tribal communities so i was wondering um you know and i i understand it's an uncomfortable question but i was just wondering in your um in your time that with all of this work you've been doing do you feel that um you hear enough about indigenous issues or do you feel like we do that it's sort of um we're pretty invisible in a lot of the talk and as far as the whole environmental issue goes do you see that changing or is it something that you as well really know little about as students in this work so that would sort of be my question i'm just wondering if the climate is changing or if it's still a real invisible topic and you know very misunderstood uh lily i see you I um, Let's start with so definitely, I don't remember, there's definitely not much in curriculum and stuff about those such issues. Actually, interestingly, uh, something happened recently with the whole <sighs> Trump doing his speech at 
Mount Rushmore. And my mom had mentioned it and I looked it up and it was an interesting fact about how that area was actually like in a treaty and it was supposed to be protected and like given to um, an indigenous group. And then that, like in history, we took it from them. And I thought that was really upsetting. And I think in a way, if we can um, bring forth how all the like environmental issues and stuff, I think if we're able to do better with conservation of land and stuff, it would definitely give an opportunity to maybe kind of relearn history and give out more truths and definitely in a way protect indigenous lands that, you know, we had in treaties promised them and maybe even expand it in a way. Because I know, well, what I kind of assume in a way is since they were here first before all the industrialization and everything, they were a lot more connected to nature and took a lot better care of it than what we're doing. I really do hope that the issues can really be brought forth because I think they have a lot, in a way, more experience and a lot more concern and connection than what we do when we just pave over and cut down trees and everything. Love it. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. That was sort of my, my, my question. I'm just, um, as I said, I was very surprised at the amount of students that knew nothing about our communities and especially in Massachusetts where we all live and uh, the town of Plymouth being a Plymouth tribe of all towns celebrating the Plymouth 400 um, and to have our lands be right there under their feet. Uh, we're just wondering and we're hopeful that this climate is changing and it's time to add the indigenous voice to this inclusion and equity talk that we hear so much about. Um, okay, thank you. Anyone else wants to add? I appreciate it, thank you. Nicole, did you? Hey. Great. Yes. Okay. I think, um, I'm glad that you brought that up because that definitely is um, something that before I've noticed was not really a big issue. Like we were taught in school, you know, but that was it. You know, it was like short. Um, and recently, um, definitely not as much as it needs to be of a big issue. It has been, uh, you know, it has been caught to your attention. Um, I've, I've heard, first heard of, for example, the Dakota Access Pipeline um, in AP environmental class. And so these classes like these um, are the reason that, you know, we learn about this stuff, but again, it's not as big of an issue as it should be, um, like you say as well. And I agree with you 100%. Um, I do think that it is gaining a little bit more attention and it is through social media, for example, um, I've seen people Post about, um, for example, um, what happened on the 4th of July, um, what is happening with the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, and for example, at a school, um, instead of Columbus Day, we do acknowledge that it's Indigenous People Day, and um, clubs and uh, other social groups at our school will do protests and raise awareness on these days. Um, in order to get more people's attention. And it definitely needs to be a bigger part of the conversation. Thank you very much. I appreciate your, your time and you know, answering that for me. Yeah, Mary Kate, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, I just kind of want to like emphasize what both Lily and Nicole said. Um, it's definitely um, brought up in classes but if you are in them, like it's not like a widespread talked about conversation unless it's through like social media or if it's brought up specifically like in a conversation. Um, so definitely trying to make that more of a widespread thing as long in intuition with um, the environment, if we could like find a way to like combine everything and just pour the knowledge bucket on everybody, then um, maybe we can figure it out. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I very much appreciate it. Maybe I'll get to meet you ladies one day in my endeavors on my mission to protect our four-legged, winged, and thinned family relatives, as we call them. <laughs> yeah, and um, uh, Lily, I think it was you who mentioned that um, 
that you assume that the indigenous populations had a, a closer relationship to nature because obviously it was pre-industrialization. And that's some of the work that Melissa Ferretti has been doing with the Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe of which she is president and chair lady. And they are working on tr uh, traditional ecological knowledge. So not only uh, training their youth in that knowledge that they may have, might have uh, not gotten as much as they should have, but also spreading the word to other groups and organizations and collaborating with us with Watershed Action Alliance to share that. So that was um, very astute, thank you. Do we have any more questions from WA members? I'll make sure everyone has an opportunity, Mehdi, Patty? Uh, yes, I, I just oh, wanna sorry, say how impressed I am by the enthusiasm and commitment of these young people. I just think this is, it's inspiring. So thank you for what you're doing. Yes. Can indeed. you hear me? Yes, yes, we all can. And, and I definitely agree with you very, this has been very inspiring. Um, and I hope that uh, Mary Kate, Lily and Nicole, you would consider if you're contacted by an, any of us in the future, perhaps going back to the high school and speaking about your experiences, because there's nothing like hearing from a graduate of your high school about what they're doing, what they thought of in Friarathon, you know, uh, how important it is to get out in nature, experience different things, open their minds up to climate change, vegetarianism and all that. And so you may be approached by one of us for that in the future. Uh, so uh, Patty, did you have a question? You'll need to unmute. Uh, Patty may have a question, but unfortunately we can't hear it. Patty, if you can unmute, uh, we'll get your question later. Um, there we go. Okay. Am I unmuted? Yes, I can't can't hear it now. Now. Okay. Okay. First of all, I want to. I, I echo the same the same comments. The three of you, young ladies, are absolutely magnificent. You clearly worked very hard. Uh, to you know, to, to take advantage of your education, and you're really bright stars coming out of your high school and completing your as, as you complete or have completed college education and furthering your education. You should so totally be commended for that. Um, and I, I'm particularly impressed by all three of you having a commitment to making a being a change agent. You know, making making the uh, being a representative for your younger generation. Um, if, if I had a question, I think my one question would be is, have you had to deal with uh, resistance to change? Uh, people who are, you know, not, not interested maybe in what you have to say or are downplayed the importance of those things you hold dear. And how, do, how have you dealt with that? Resistance to change, who would like to address that? Anyone? I'm sure there's been some resistance to change. <laughs> Mary Kate? Um, yeah, I guess I'll go first. Um, I've definitely heard that and um and it's it's not to like put a damper on the older generation, but it was from my like, grandparents and, um, and just like other like people who are um a little bit older who just don't really kind of want to process the fact that we need to change things like they're very um kind of stuck in their own ways i guess um and i when we when brockton started doing the new recycling bins and having a new schedule they basically went from like a paper a separate paper plastic and everything and made it into like just one big trash can or recycling bin and then they made the trash can smaller and um my grandma called me the day she got her trash can and was like, why is my trash can small and my recycling big? I'm like, well, Graham, um, we need to save the environment. Okay. We're, we don't want to drown, do we? Um, and just kind of just trying to explain it to her. And she just went la 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 la. Like she was not for it. Um, and then was just keep, kept complaining about how her trash can was too small and they only took it, um, like they took it every week and then they took recycling every two weeks and she just the whole adjustment was very um hard for her and kind of she kind of just resisted every kind of little explanation I would try to give to her 
Um, and that like in different other environmental issues as well, it would just be like very hard to like break that barrier. But um, that and also just like with other towns, like trying to under like communicate and understand like what they're doing and um, just kind of like sharing a sharing different opinions. Some people are very just like, well, I don't want to change what I'm doing. So let's just keep you know, recycling things that still have like food residue on it. I'm like, well, you can't really do that. Um, but yeah, I've definitely had some backlash resistance on what we need to do to improve our environment. Yeah, I, I hear you on that. Um, I do think, however, that it's great that your grandmother actually asked you for some advice. And although it sounds like she was resistant, I bet some of that information is slowly getting through to her, especially because it's coming from her granddaughter. And, it, it, you know, change is hard, uh, especially for older people and change around recycling and trash seems to be a huge issue here in the Northeast. It's kind of funny for me. I'm not from the Northeast, um, but keep repeating yourself in a loving way. And thank you for doing that because I've worked in recycling myself. <laughs> Anyone else about uh, resistance, uh, Lily or Nicole? Lily. Yeah. Um, so one thing uh, maybe Kate mentioned that I, I experienced a lot in my class and stuff was the whole uh, people, it's really hard to change people's habits, especially when we're built in a society that, you know, single-use plastics are such a big thing and driving long distance really made towns that are wide enough to have so many cars. Um, and stuff and the science and stuff how people use science in a way to support their policy whether it's to fight it or to just business as usual of course and um there's so many different misconceptions and stuff and how people get into that kind of like one track mind with like only one big thing will help change like you know planting trees that's gonna be the way we solve climate change but it's not there's so many from recycling, reducing all the single-use plastic, especially to planting trees, to uh, you know protecting wildlife and everything. There's so many things that everyone can do. It's not just like one group of people, or, like one action. We all have small things and big things that we have to focus on. And um, I've more experienced a lot more more quieter kind of resistance. Even like myself, sometimes it's hard to break certain habits or um, ideals that I grew up with. And as I keep educating myself I keep seeing that I really do need to um, change such kind of things um, and there was one class um, I had taken and there was a seminar or something I can't remember exactly but it was kind of when you're talking to someone and having a conversation and we learned basically kind of like the tone of how you approach that conversation can really change um, how receptive the other person is to listening so you know not being angry at someone but just um, kind of trying to be really polite and understanding if they really are set in their ways as well and just kind of keep educating people especially at a young age is really important now um, yeah yeah thank you for that point that the tone matters your receptivity matters and and approaching someone with anger without anger but with acceptance and tolerance how important that is and trying to get your message across it's still may not it may take you a long time but uh if you start with anger you will definitely get nowhere yeah so i think um that wraps it up for for our panel here we've got to move on to the rest of our meeting um we've taken a lot of your time and we really appreciate it uh lily Nicole and Mary Kate that you uh, devoted so much of your time both to talking with us now and I know that you spent some time in preparation and reviewing what you, you've done with Envirothon and, and so forth and we very much appreciate that. I know you heard several different people who talked about how inspiring you are and you definitely are and uh, we hope to, to continue communication with you in the future. And Rachel, kudos to you as well for uh, doing Envirothon, being the organizer, being a model to many of these young women as well as young men and uh, doing the, such exciting programs in Brockton that I, th I think you will be hearing from Watershed Action Alliance as well as our member organizations in the future. Thank you for organizing these um, tremendous young women to come speak with us.
Thank you so much for thinking of us. Um, and it's just great. Like I haven't seen these girls in years. So it's been a really special opportunity for me to reconnect with you ladies. Thank you so much for, for doing this. It moved me to tears to hear you speak. Oh. I miss you guys. Oh. Lovely. Well, the, we'll say goodbye to, to Rachel and Nicole, um, Mary Kate and Lily, and um, we'll continue on with our meeting. Thanks again. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Thanks Thank you for having so us. Much. Thank you.